Sri Manesh Kumar, Sri Palam Bhattacharya, my fellow Calcutton. Um, thank you very much for a very warm introduction. Um, I'm always surprised in a way because people say uh, that um, it's an honor uh, for them, for me to be there with them. But in fact, the reverse is true. It's a huge honor for me that so many people have come together to hear me speak. And of course, uh, not only an honor, but also a daunting task. Uh, you know, one of the great advantages to broadcasting, which has really been my field all my life, is you can't see when people fall asleep or when they get bored or anything like that. But in a room like this, uh, I can see. Um, <laughs> so look out. Um, uh, it's a, a particular honor, of course, to be the first person to give a lecture in this uh, series of lectures, Sanva. Um, and I want to take this opportunity uh, under the title of Creative Listening uh, to speak uh, a bit about the media in general, but more particularly I want to speak about radio um, because it is the media I love most, the media I worked in most, it's the media I believe in and I believe in this country in particular it's an underrated media. But I want to speak about it uh, in a, a broader context as well. I want to speak about it in the context of listening, the importance of listening. The first sort of uh, 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 impression of the media I have in my mind, my first memory of the media is listening to the radio. Uh, in Calcutta, my parents had a very old-fashioned, heavy um, radiogram, you know, and, uh, his master's voice radiogram. And I can remember the news coming crackling over the short wave. Um, I remember when I got back to India, to Britain, some of the programs. There was a wonderful detective program <laughs> called <laughs> Dick Barton Special Agent. And there were brilliant comedies, which if any of you uh, can find them on WhatsApp or YouTube or something like that, um, you would realize uh, the impression that they left. Programs like ITMA or Much Binding in the Marsh. Um, so radio was there with me for my youngest days. And uh, of course, radio <coughs> has changed. Uh, uh, have, have been, remained with me. When I look back on my life, I realize that I have <coughs> seen the most incredible changes in my life. And I sometimes think that my generation has seen more change than any previous generation. I have to say the speed at which things are changing now uh, might, uh, in another 80 years, someone standing like me might be able to say they've seen far more rapid change. But you know, if you look back um, to when I was born, I was born <coughs> when India was still uh, part of the British Empire, the jewel in the imperial crown. I lived for nine years. So in some ways, I call myself a relic of the British Raj. Um, when I went to school, uh, we were sent away to school for nine months in Darjeeling. Um, and when we went uh, off to school, uh, those were the days when railways were still dominant. No one thought of going anywhere in any other way. So I went to Darjeeling. It took a day and a half, uh, no, two days, well, a night and a day to get there. My father was director of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway, and so I would post about this on the Darjeeling train, which took an incredibly long time to reach Darjeeling. Um, at the same time, uh, at school, we went around the place with our cupboard in ink, because there was uh, the only way you could write was with a pen that you dipped in an inkwell. There were not even 
any arrows, any ball points in those days. Um, then again, of course, uh, the communications were totally different. In the Calcutta of my father, uh, there was a tradition that you stopped work on Friday lunchtime because uh, Friday afternoon the mail boat left and therefore uh, you couldn't send any more mail back to London or receive any more mail from London so you could have a big lunch and go home and sleep, sleep it off. Um, uh, and of course uh, they, th those were the days of letters. Now in all these things, um, including uh, the method that we used to come and go from it, yeah, by liners, uh, in all these things uh, there were merits and things have been lost uh, in them, as well as gains. Uh, the, if you look, for instance, at um, the uh, question of mail and writing, um, there is no doubt about it that because we find it so easy to communicate now, there is far too much communication. In the old days, if you were in Calcutta and your head office was in London, you had to take decisions um, uh, because uh, the, 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 you didn't have the time to consult with London a lot of the time. Nowadays, because of all this communication which is going on, uh, there is far too much consultation, I think, very often take place, and things instead of being simplified by become uh, intensely complicated. Um, so that's just one example. Another example is uh, the liners. I can re still remember the names of three liners which I traveled from traveled on when my parents went back to England for leaves. One was called the Viceroy of India, one was Strathmore, they were both PO boats, and one was the British India boat, the Madrasa, the, um, uh, the Masala, not the Masala, <laughs> the Masila. Um, these, uh, and I can remember the pressure of those voyages, uh, and still, uh, the, you can see what we've uh, lost by the decline of sea transport in the pleasure people take in cruising. If it wasn't that, cru that traveling by sea is a wonderful experience, why would it be that people are cruising uh, so much, the cruising industry is going so much? So you have these examples. Um, they're not very forceful examples, but I think they make a very important point that in all progress, uh, things are lost as well, and in all progress, uh, there are uh, things which go wrong, things which are created uh, um, uh, to uh, excessively, uh, damage is caused, environmental damage is caused, whatever it might be. Let's just take the example of what has happened because of the increasing availability of air travel and the increasing uh, ease of road travel. Uh, there came a stage as a result of this when people were saying we don't want railways. Railways are old-fashioned were roads aren't made in. But if you look at it from an environmental point of view, if you look at it uh, from uh, also a pleasure in travel and convenience in travel, uh, railways have proved to them to be, uh, by modernizing themselves, it has been shown that railways are, in many cases, the best way of travel. And there's no doubt about it that railways are the best way of carrying um, large loads, which <coughs> coal might be what else it is. And also, uh, nowadays, people in this country are so obsessed by air that they will fly to Dehradun or something like that. And if you calculate, if you do the calculation, 
actually, you get there quicker. Uh, if you go by Shatabdi, you won't have that hideous, and I say hideous, airport experience. You won't have to queue seven times before you get on the, the train. And you will have all the train in time. You're sitting in the train, you're there in one place, and you can read a book, you can work on your computer, you can do whatever you want. So the time on the train is not wasted. The time on the aeroplane is almost totally wasted. Yet people are so seduced by the concept of progress and the concept that this is the modern way to go that they will do something like fly to Tarotu. And I think, I remember in Britain, we were so convinced that railways were out that we had a, a report commissioned by a man called Dr. Beachy and his report was so savage that there were going to, he suggested there should be no trains uh, uh, over the England British English border. So no trains should go from London to Scotland, for instance. Well, thank heavens, we were saved from that. And now, because we have realized the damage which was done by, by uh, cutting our railways back, because we realize that, we are now reopening lines which the dreaded Dr. Beachy closed. So in all these things, a point I'm trying to make is uh, things which appear to be modern, things which appear to be um, wonderful in every respect, have their disadvantages. And if I could just go back one uh, more time to railways, we all now realize that the motor car is, has very, very minus qualities, if I can use that phrase, uh, as well as, of course, usefulness. And we've just been talking, uh, before I came here with your colleagues, we were talking about the plan to build a good suburban railway service. And the metro has shown what railways can do for you. Now, I'm saying all this because I want to speak about radio in this context. Because when um, television came along, and I still remember the days, of course, when there was no television. I remember the 50s when I first saw black and white television and the days I was talking to you about when I loved radio and radio was dominant. But then along came television. And I was, interestingly, I was a BBC radio correspondent, privately. I did television from time to time, but reluctantly. Uh, and I was a BBC radio correspondent. But of course, the television correspondence, because it was uh, the medium of the moment they thought uh, used to rather look down on us radio people. But I would argue that we radio people were actually um, doing a far more important job. Uh, and at the same time, we were uh, doing a far hard, more difficult job as well. I think we were doing a more important job for one very obvious reason that the millions of people in India who knew about the BBC knew about it because of BBC radio, not BBC television. And we had a very large audience in this country. The audience was so large, uh, and this is not <coughs> entirely due to me in any way, it's due to the BBC, due to the colleagues who worked with me, etc. But the audience was so large that after the 1990 election, when Rajiv Gandhi uh, didn't form the government, the Congress party said it was the BBC influence which uh, uh, cost the Congress party the election. Now I have to say Rajiv Gandhi called me in and said, I do not believe this. But the fact is that our audience was large enough for people to believe that uh, we could have this sort of influence. 
Now, uh, that was what uh, the, the media I worked for. And that was the media I was proud to work for uh, uh, as compared with the television media and the television correspondents. But the point uh, I'm making is that when uh, I came, uh, when I stayed on in India, um, I used to get invited quite often to go and lecture in uh, schools of journalism. And what happened when I would go to a school of journalists, journalism, and talk to them about radio? They would inevitably say, radio is finished. Television has swept radio aside. But of course, uh, that, that proves to be a mistake. Television has never uh, managed to sweep radio aside. And again, you see, this is an example of what I'm talking to you about. Change comes, but it doesn't necessarily devalue what is already there. And so now if you take the situation in Britain, uh, more people in daily turn on their radios than turn on their television sets. The main political program of the day in Britain it's not a television program, but it's a today program on Radio 4. That's the one the Prime Minister goes on. That's the one ministers want to go on. That's the one all the politicians um, want to go on. I, for 24 years, I've only just stopped. For 24 years, I did a radio program uh, which went out at the um, uh, godly hours of 6 o'clock in the morning and 11.30 at night on uh, Radio 4 on a Sunday and we would get a combined audience of over a million people. And when the BBC decided very recently that the, old, the program should be, uh, uh, new programs should not be made because they didn't have the money to make them, so they would play repeats the outcry in the press was incredible. Uh, this is for a radio program at that time of the day. So the idea that radio is dead, which got about because of this habit we have of thinking new things, sweet old things apart, uh, was, uh, had been shown to be absolutely untrue. And right at the end, I want to talk to you briefly about radio in this country. But first, I want to come back to listening, which I'm meant to be talking to you all the time. Why is it that radio is still so popular? And why is it that so many people love radio? It's their favorite media. Well, I think it's because of the pleasure of listening. And what is the pleasure of listening? Well, uh, one thing about listening is that uh, it is something you have to pay attention to. Television, you can get by by the pictures telling the story, so you don't need to bother too much about the script necessarily. But radio, unless you listen and listen intensively, uh, you won't uh, get uh, you won't enjoy it. The second thing is, and this is, I think is very important, that in radio, um, the pictures uh, which you get on radio are pictures which have to be made by the writing journalists and have to be made by the listener as well in the listener's mind. And we always <coughs> say, the pictures on radio are better than the pictures on television. But because you, as the listener, make those pictures uh, using what the radio is saying to you, uh, but they become your pictures and they belong to you in a way which nothing, uh, a closeness which nothing uh, on television can belong to you in such a close way. I would put it a different way as well. In radio, good radio broadcaster makes him 
makes you as the audience feel that he is talking to you personally, as individual to individual. And this uh, uh, is because of, again, uh, the intimacy of radio as a medium. It's a medium which can speak and does speak <coughs> directly to you. I always remember once I was uh, speaking in a, in a uh, cathedral in Britain, and I said to people, rather I like I might say now to you, I don't know why you've all come, because I'm only a journalist. And after it was over, an old lady came up to me and said, I've come because I listen to you on the radio and I think you are my friend. Now that is something uh, which I believe you get through radio uh, in a way that you can get through any other media. And you get it because of this unique pleasure of listening. And the last thing, of course, about radio and about listening is that listening enables you to do other things too. So why is breakfast radio so popular? Because people then get the news while they're shaving, while they're cooking, while they're putting on their shoes, preparing to go to the office, whatever it be. So many people, as soon as they wake up, just stretch their hand out press the button and on comes the radio and they keep the radio going until they leave the house to go to work or whatever else it is. Now, if you have the television set on, well, the script of the television set won't be worth listening to, um, so you'll have to keep watching it and how can you keep watching it and shave or whatever else it is you're going to do. And that, again, is another thing which re makes radio a particularly intimate uh, media. Because time and again, <coughs> you are listening to radio on your own. Now, uh, I believe that this listening uh, is something which is very important, not just uh, in the context of radio, but I think it's very important for all of us in our lives. And I think particularly at this time when we are being subjected to a barrage of noise, of speeches, <coughs> of uh, acrimony, of attacks, of unpleasantness, and all the rest of it, what we really need to do is to almost turn that noise off and listen, uh, and listen. Because what uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, ultimately about listening is that without listening and without learning to listen, and of course uh, radio helps us to learn to listen, we can uh, never um, we can never uh, listen to the inner voice, and we can never have a sensible. Uh, conversation, a sensible argument. We can never uh, discuss uh, if we don't learn to live. What stops you listening more than anything else? I think it's probably two things. One is sometimes the desire you have to talk more than the desire you have to, to listen. And the other is not being willing to give and take in a discussion. Not be willing to realize that there are two sides to a question. And the funny thing is, the strange thing is, that in India, this is something which you should be particularly prone to do. Listening is something which is part of the tradition of India, which was described by Amata said in his um, uh, book, uh, The Argumentative India. And if you'll forgive me, I just uh, want to read a bit from that book. It's uh, quite a long bit, so you will have to listen attentively if you're going to get it. But what he says is, 
even though the importance of dialogue and discussion has been emphasized in the history of many countries in the world, the fact that the Indian subcontinent has a particularly strong tradition in recognizing and pursuing a dialogic commitment is certainly worth noting, especially in the darkening world with violence and terrorism in which we live. It is indeed good to remember that some of the op earliest open public dis deliberations in the world were hosted in India to discuss different points of view with a particularly large meeting arranged by Ashoka in the 3rd century BCE. So there you have a statement about the Indian tradition uh, of dialogue and that has to be a tradition of listening because you have to be prepared to listen to the other side and then prepared perhaps to uh, change your mind. So this tradition of listening uh, belongs to India, but in the present election, uh, I see nothing, I hear nothing about listening. Um, I see no dialogue, no dialect, just basically a rather ugly puncture, uh, which I think is profoundly un-Indian. But uh, I would also like to uh, mention Mahatma Gandhi in this context as well, because there is a type of listening um, which uh, is very important and which is listening to yourself listening to the inner voice within yourself. Mm -hmm. And the Mahatma said, uh, or Mahatma spoke of the voice of God, others would, would some maybe speak of the little voice within you. But he said, um, for me, the voice, that is the voice of God, was more real than my own existence. It has never failed me, or for that matter, anyone else. And everyone, when um, uh, when wills can hear the voice. It is within everyone, but like everything else, it requires previous and definite preparation. And I think that brings me back also to what I was saying earlier uh, about uh, listening to the radio. Um, that listening uh, isn't, uh, is not uh, something which is automatic or easy. It is something which requires attention and even perhaps practice. I was told recently, because I'm very deaf, um, that I had to wear uh, a hearing aid all the time because only in that way would my brain get uh, accustomed to listening through the hearing aid. And I think that we all need to keep our brains attuned to listening. Uh, as the Mahatma said, uh, it requires previous and definite preparation and constant use. And lastly, uh, I will quote uh, another great Indian, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And she said, God speaks in the silence of the heart, listening is the beginning of prayer. And so the other thing which listening demands is valuing silence. And that again brings me back to what I said. So often our own desire to speak, to be the person who's speaking, destroys our willingness to listen. <coughs> and finally, when we come to radio and back to radio and radio in this country, let me stress radio is the unique listening medium. It is the only medium which depends entirely on listening. And this radio, wonderful media in this country is in shackles. And I'm sorry to tell you that I went to Kathmandu uh, on a radio conference some years back, and it was a South Asian radio. And I find that India, the great democracy, in India, 
radio was more in shackled, more limited than in any other country, including Pakistan. Because in this country still, after so many years after the, the Supreme Court has said that the airwaves of the country belong to the people of India, still the airwaves, the radio airwaves belong to the government of India and no other organization is allowed to do radio uh, which includes current affairs. And that is, as I said, denying you, the people of India, the opportunity of at breakfast time hearing a program like the BBC's Today program. So I hope that what I've said to you uh, will have some meaning in your Sunburn series of talks. I hope that to public relations people, uh, you will uh, perhaps think a bit about the importance of listening. Uh, you will, I, I hope, think about the importance of understanding what people are saying and understand the importance of uh, people uh, having confidence in what, that what you are saying to them. Because uh, all this will only come about if you listen to people. And I think it is a far more complicated job, even in this respect, <coughs> listening to people is far more complicated and far more sensitivity than merely having uh, consumer research and such things like that. And uh, these rather absurd <coughs> forms you fill in to say whether you like something or not. Uh, it requires a sensitivity to listen to the voice of the people, just as Mahatma Gandhi said, it requires the sensitivity to listen to the voice of God. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Your talk was indeed an interesting one, and I'm sure it took many people sitting here for a walk down the memory lane. Ladies and gentlemen, the house is now open for questions. So now you may address the questions to Sir William Mark today. Any of you may have some questions for sir? India and why TV uh, overweight and over uh, radio? What wrong went in India to adopt radio, to adopt TV then radio, as a mean of mass communication? Why did I adopt it? No, no, why, why, India, why India could not adopt radio as a mean of communication? Uh, uh, because I think, uh, absolutely because uh, it is controlled by the government. Uh, and the government uh, uh, cannot, uh, no government, uh, which can be the control of the media, can resist the temptation to use the media to spread it to own them. Um, I remember in the time of the emergency, uh, the Director General of All India Radio, a man called Kisi Chatterjee, a personal friend of mine, said to Indira Gandhi, uh, he said, uh, what we are doing is useless because uh, everyone knows it's government propaganda. But Indra Gandhi said, I don't care about credibility. Um, that was, that's the problem for radio then. That is the problem uh, for radio today now. I'll tell you a, a funny little story about that because when uh, Indra Gandhi came back to power again, what uh, um, uh, uh, what would have wrong? How she lost the support of the people, and she said, "I never lost the support of the people. They were only misled by rumors." And then she smiled and said, "Many of them spread by the BBC." Well, that showed, of course, 
And A, she didn't understand, not in the car didn't understand the failure of all India radio. Um, and it, it also, uh, in, in a sense, proved uh, that the BBC, the danger of, uh, uh, of uh, government control of media, that rumors spread. If accurate information doesn't get out and information people trust, then they will listen to rumors. And of course now, you have this, this problem even more acutely because rumors can be spread so rapidly through, through the social media. Thank you, sir. We have another question. Yeah. Sir, um, thank you for your speech and it was something great to listen okay. to you. Use the mic. Can you please use the mic, sir? And would, uh, it would be nice if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rajiv Chibber and uh, I am with a medical device uh, uh, company, Heading Communications and uh, Policy. Uh, sir, uh, you talked about uh, radio and the patience of listening. Um, as a question, um, in this heavy digital era, hasn't radio just been reduced as a marketing tool rather than something which enhanced knowledge or could have really moved regimes as you said? No, I, I don't agree with that uh, uh, at all. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Britain, certainly not. Um, uh, I, uh, it's a, I wish you could uh, listen. It, well, I know, I'll tell you what. Uh, all you need to do is put in your Google search BBC Radio 4 in our times. In our times. And these are historical programs. And if you think that's just a marketing tool, <laughs> well, I think you'll change your mind. Uh, no, very, very much not so. I mean, I, I think it's good that it should be used as a marketing tool as well. And I think you'd be even right that it should market it with uh, intelligent programs should help you to, to market. I see nothing wrong in that. But it's not just a marketing tool, really, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. My name is Aisha Gua. I'm a communication consultant, sir. Uh, my question to you is uh, that uh, in the era that we live in today, when you are telling us about the importance of creative listening, uh, is that uh, under any kind of threat because we don't have patience, because we basically want to speak more than listen at the moment? Most of us are in a hurry. There are all kinds of uh, pressures on the communication people because otherwise communication is about listening as much as it is about speaking. But somewhere we find that the voice has become more powerful than the ear. So, <laughs> I, I think you have summed up a, a lot of what I would say very much better than I have been able to do it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely could. And I mean, this election is an absolutely classic example. There is absolutely no hearing. Uh, if you like to, to, uh, to uh, uh, use the analogy, it is in some sense it's like a ping pong or table tennis match. Modi says something unpleasant about Rahul, Rahul says something unpleasant about Modi. And that's about the level of discourse. And I think, uh, I don't, I think in a great democracy like India, you should have, even at an election, perhaps more so than ever at an election, a discourse, a discussion uh, on what has happened. And the other thing which you raised, uh, I think is very important, uh, the pressure of all of us. And so much of this pressure comes because we simply don't understand the value of sitting quietly and listening. Listening to ourselves, listening to God if we believe in God, uh, listening to the inner voice, and listening to the radio. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We have another question. 
good evening, sir. My name is Om. I am uh, uh, Mr. Mukesh Kumar Sinha's uh, uh, son. He's working in Power Grid uh, Corporation of India Limited. I, I wanted to, uh, uh, I had a very uh, uh, dip, a divergent, I want to speak on a divergent topic uh, today, but I'm very inquisitive to know that uh, you witnessed uh, uh, a great socio-political and cultural changes throughout uh, the di dimension, time dimension that you have been reporting in India. So I wanted to know, uh, do you think is there a special or a unique feature that sets India apart from the rest of the world or South Asian countries? Yes, I, I think there, there are uh, things. I'm, I, I, I personally believe that uh, India uh, has a lot to teach the world if only India will practice it itself. And I think in this matter of listening <coughs> and in the great tradition. Only yesterday uh, I was reading for something I'm writing uh, about the dialogues and the discussions which you used to take place um, following the time of uh, Shankaracharya and the discussions which used to take, to take place uh, between those who thought there was only one being, uh, one Brahman, and those who thought that there was a separation between humans and, and Brahman. And it, it was a wonderful, and uh, there was a lot of humor in it as well. Someone said uh, during the course of all these discussions, Someone rather rudely said about Shankara, he was a very stupid man because he could only count up to one. And that was why he was so insistent on there should only be one. Um, so there is this tradition. Uh, and this tradition also, very importantly, the tradition of dialogue, has shielded Indian philosophy, at least, from the problem that I as a Christian have faced and Christianity have faced. As Christians we were taught up to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. But as an, uh, in Indian philosophy as I understand it, uh, no one is saying that this is absolutely the only way. Everyone is saying God is indescribable. They're saying neti, 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 not quite this, not quite this, not quite this. And certainly from uh, India, I have learned that Christianity is not the only way to God, although I believe it is a way to God. Uh, so that is a huge thing which India could give. India could stand for the complete opposite to what actually is happening uh, in the world now. Even in your field now, and in the field of advertising, all the competition is uh, based on, uh, uh, all the advertising is based on competition and based on the concept usually of I'm better than you, or my uh, shaving soap is better than your shaving soap, or my cola is better than your cola. It's all about combat, combat, combat. And that, I think, is where a lot of the pressure comes from. But in the Indian tradition, it would be about dialogue, discussion. Uh, quite fierce, quite difficult to dialogue sometimes. But, of course, sadly, it's not. Any uh, more questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Sir Namaskar, I'm Sarvesh and I'm a member of PRSI and I run a PR firm called PR Professionals. India uh, is a place of Tansen as well as Kansen. I, when I say Kansen, I say people who can listen and good listeners. I believe uh, you spoke about uh, Vedic culture and where a guru used to teach and the sishyas used to listen those things. But I believe that uh, the biggest challenge about hearing today is, or a good listener is, that uh, with the advent of social media, the challenges has gone have gone very high. The comfort, uh, radio was popular because of comfort, it was because of its reach, and it was easy. So when I was in my village, I spent my early life in villages, and there was no electricity and no power, and at 7.30 in the evening, BBC radio was there, and we also used to listen to BBC radio. But today, 
you go to any corner you have a mobile in your hand and you can just watch anything and everything so how we are going to counter that a is a, what are your suggestion and b is i feel that radio we also need some modernization new things to come up in radio what is your suggestion to indian radio uh, people who are heading that and how can they improve it thank you sir well my suggestion would be you be surprised to hear that I think you should have public uh, uh, service broadcasting, uh, genuine public service broadcasting, which is broadcasting which is neither influenced by financial considerations because its finance is a guarantee, nor by the government because it is independent <coughs> of the government. And that is, I can honestly say what the BBC is in uh, for what, 40 years, 50 years. I joined in 1964 and I've been associated right up to now. Uh, I have never once uh, been told uh, what uh, I should say by the government. Uh, I remember once in Pakistan and I was called in by the High Commissioner and he said to me, the British High Commissioner, he said, uh, you are very unpopular with Mr. Bhutto, I suggest you leave the country. So I said to him, well, thank you very much. I was intending to go back to India, but now I'll stay for another two weeks or so. Um, and we were, we used to have regular meetings when I was working in London with the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office was very angry because we were, ang not anti the Shah, but we were <coughs> publishing a broadcasting uh, news that the Shah didn't like, um, the Shah of Iran, and the, the Foreign Office, because of all the trade deals and various other things, did not want the Shah to be toppled. Um, so they used to t try and tell us uh, what to broadcast, but we would say, well, we will decide what to broadcast because we are not broadcasting what the British government wants, we're broadcasting what we see as the news, simple and simply and straightforward. So, so I think that public, yeah, one, the two advantages of public sector broadcasting. One, of course, there are always arguments how independent it is and how, uh, you know, currently in England, there are arguments is Brexit, pro-Brexit or pro anti-Brexit. Um, but basically, BBC sticks to and that has an influence also on other broadcasters because if they go too much in the other direction, people will listen to them and listen to BBC and realize how absurd their broadcasting is because it's so far out of time. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is simply uh, that uh, India, if television and do current why shouldn't it raise it to the It's an absurd position and ridiculous So that's the other uh, step I think uh, which, 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 which could be taken. But also, I think you'll find that um, uh, more, uh, as, the, uh, as the pressures on life get more, as the noise gets more, as the social media gets more disturbing, is. People will actually uh, go back as a reaction, will seek for peace and for comfort, as you say, um, out of radio. And already, I mean, they are doing it because uh, the program which I made was a relaxing, a spiritual program. We did it in the time before um, and we would discuss our, our last program was a line by T. S. Eliot, which is in my end, my beginnings. And that was all about how in life, uh, when something ends, it is very often the opening to something new. And the line in life, how you end your child, end your childhood to come and live so so they were made it to talk for questions, not on the use of the Thank you very much. Uh, Any question? Yeah, there's one.
Yeah. This would be the last question. Hi, sir. This is Shalini Sharma. I'm a journalist working with PSU Watch. So, you spoke about how the art of listening is missing from the political discourse right now. But you also have to admit that there is social media. And social media comes with a set of compulsions. Media, uh, media houses are coming up with like clickbait headlines and all. Political leaders have to give one-liners that catch more eyeballs that are that do well on better on social media. So there's a whole culture which prioritizes shrilling and screaming over listening. So how do you undo that, or how do you deal with that? <laughs> Just read again. Please take You spoke about how the art of listening is missing from the political discourse yeah. at the time. But you know, there is social media right now. We are living in times when we have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, which sort of prioritizes the idea of shilling or screaming over listening. There are certain compulsions that media houses are dealing with. They have to do clickbait headlines. Political leaders have to come up with like one-liners which get <coughs> eyeballs on social media. They, they get better reach. They get better uh, sort of sharing response on social media. How do you deal with that? And how do you... Uh, uh, sadly, most of what happens on social media is nothing to do with history, nothing to do with dialogue or anything like that. Uh, it is very aggressive, very unpleasant, and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, they, uh, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that listening and radio are, are can be a personal antidote to that. That's the, the, that's the way I would put it. And if enough people realise that uh, this was an antidote, and realize the need for, if you just think of the, the things which the three quotations talked about. Uh, they talked about our discursive discussion. Uh, the, uh, the Mahatma talked about learning to listen, and Mother Teresa talked about silence. And you put those three things together, uh, and uh, you practice in your personal life discussing, you're really to listen to other people. You practice listening, you make sure you're listening. You make sure you're not simply leaping to get, get in there when someone says something. You ought to get in there and say, that's rubbish, it's all wrong. Uh, you listen to the inner, inner voice in you. Um, then personally, there are being changed. And how, uh, your influence might be. Uh, you have to listen to me, I think you have to talk. Um, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Indeed, uh, the changes begin with the self. Thank you very much. I think uh, the house is closed for the questions. And uh, let us have a big round of applause for Sir.